Hi, I'm Stu Kagan, and welcome to Born Scrappy, the podcast for scrap metal exporters and traders. Join me in conversation with some of the most experienced traders and operators that have helped shape this incredible industry. In the first episode of Season 2, we have a growth masterclass with George Adams. George is the owner of SA Recycling, a company he built to be one of the largest recycling companies in the world, with over 140 locations and almost 4,000 people. George is one of the most knowledgeable guys in our industry and is truly inspiring. In today's episode, we talk about a day in the life, inventory control, buying the right equipment, incentives and bonus structures, and so much more. So let's get season two underway with the GOAT. But first, intro. Hey, George, how are you? Doing great, thank you. Doing really good. Awesome, George. It's a, it's a Sunday morning and we've made it happen eventually, so... I'm really excited, and um, I want to thank you for joining on your Sunday morning. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not had a your problem coffee. at all. Oh, yeah, awesome. no, I'm, dr- I'm dr- still still drinking a little bit of coffee, but that's okay. That's great, George. Um, a lot of a lot of the listeners will have seen you speak at certain events. They might have met you. They'll all know of you. Can you just run us through what a day in the life of George Adams looked like? And that could be from you know, having a cup of coffee in the morning or what sort of time you wake up and all the way into how busy your day really is. I mean, look, I, I, try, I try to get to work by six. Um, I'm usually on emails by five, you know, just because I'm awake, but I'm usually working or answering uh, by 5 a.m. and uh, try to be in the office by six or on the road by six. And the... I prefer to go to the yards. I hate to be in an office, but I end up having to go to an office a lot just because that's what you got to do. But uh, I would much rather be out in the yards, you know, with the guys. And it depends, you know, it depends what projects we're working on, right? If we're working on an acquisition, then that's one thing. If we're working on engineering projects, because I really like to be involved in engineering projects. And so we build a lot of plants. We have a lot of patents on different equipment that we've designed. And so anyway, my preference would be uh, to be out in the yards or working on the engineering projects. But, But if we're in the middle of an acquisition, then I also enjoy that. But those are really... The things that I like to do the most, um, you know, at this point in my life, you know, I'm going to be 68. My sons really handle the weeds of the business. And so I can pretty much do the stuff that I think is fun. And, you know, we have an amazing team of people, you know, at this company. We figured we got almost 3,500 employees. Or maybe we have a little more than 3,500 now, I guess. And so anyway, look, I have a lot of really, really amazing people that makes it, uh, you know, makes it so I can do the stuff I want to do. And George, what sort of time do you get back from the office or, or the yards? And do you finish at five o'clock or? Oh, no, I, I usually, uh, I usually get home between six and six thirty. Right. It's quite interesting because a lot of people look at it and they go, well, you've made it. You're in a position where you can go to the office at eight o'clock and, and leave at three o'clock. But it just shows that when you really enjoy what you do, um, you enjoy still getting up early in the morning and, and staying all day. I don't really ever look at hours like that. You know, I don't really feel like what I'm doing is working. And so I usually mm-hmm. get home. I usually get home uh, between six and seven o'clock. So. Yeah, it's awesome. George, you know, I spoke about people seeing you talk and we all believe that you're right up at the top of our industry, right at the top of the game. But I'd love to know what made you you. Right, so people will see George stand up on stage, and you'll you'll give these incredible talks, and really we look up to you. But what I'd love to know is, you know, it's not always easy getting to the top, and people have a look at it and they aspire to it, but they think that um, often that journey can be easy, or you know, for whatever reason you got up to the top and look at your life. But you know, what were some of the trials and tribulations you might have gone through, um, obstacles that you've had, you know, stories like that to help people relate? to your story of, of the growth that you've had? You know, people always ask me whether I had some grand plan. And uh, 
and really I tell people all the time, you know, my grand plan was just to survive and make payroll. My dad's goal back then was to do $20,000 a month uh, in profit. And so, I mean, that was his goal. You know, he used to tell me all the time, Sonny boy, if we can make $20,000 a month, we'll be making a lot of money. And so, I mean, that was, that was his goal. And so, you know, that's where we started. You know, when you're a little company like that, it's all about uh, surviving. You know, it's all about making payroll and it's all about surviving. And so we had tremendous obstacles from, you know, hazardous waste issues to uh, in the beginning, we didn't even have a shredder, right? And so, you know, trying to build a shredder, trying to get permits, city trying to take our property through a minute domain. I mean, there's a lot of issues, you know, that happened. A tremendous number of people helped me along the way. I just would have never made it with, <clears throat> without all those people. So, I mean, I think everybody that has success um, gets there because people help them. You know, and I try to help, you know, everybody that I can. Uh, you know, people always tell me I'm too open, but, you know, I'm very open about what I do, um, what I think, you know, how we should run the business. Obviously, I wrote my book, you know, which anybody can get copies of, which I really lay out my thoughts and philosophies and stuff on it. And so I'm pretty open about it just because so many people helped me. But look, at there was a lot of people that never thought we would survive the different things that happened to us. So. Yeah, it's um, it's funny you put people on a pedestal and um, it all looks like um, rainbows and unicorns and their life was really easy and um, it all started as big as it is now. But uh, you look back and as you say, $20,000 a month um, and you will have made it, right? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, look at it. In, in, 19, in 1987, the uh, DTSC, you know, which is Department of Toxic Substance Control, shut our shredder down because they said that we were uh, creating hazardous waste because of PCBs. And then, uh, so then our bank panicked and our bank seized our line of credit and bounced, you know, half a million dollars worth of checks. And then the, uh, the city piled on and decided, well, if we were creating hazardous waste and we were a nuisance and they really wanted our property for a car lot, and so they pulled my use permit, filed criminal charges against me. I mean, you know, you just, you know, the problems that come at you all at once. And, uh, and anyway, there's a lot of people that figured that we were going to fold. But, you know, you, what, what you do, right? It, you really don't have a choice. You just come to work. And so, and that's really what happened, right? I mean, you don't quit. You just come to work. And so all those problems we had, you know, we just came to work. And so, I mean, for through. those... That listen and are going through a hard time. I mean, um, we've just heard you explain that you nearly lost your business, right? I mean, when the bank shuts you down, it it can get pretty hair raising. Yeah, well, so I mean, look at the bank shuts down, pull our line of credit, but we had a little wrecking yard, and so we sold parts, and then we would take that cash and use it to buy scrap. And mm. and uh, anyway, I don't know. Yeah, it's just you just keep going. Yeah, no, that's awesome to hear. Um, you know, and then my shredder was shut down, so I had no way to process the tin. So then Johnny's dad, you know, John Sacco from Sierra, Ben, you know, Ben Sacco gave me a baler to use, a, a, a shear baler. And anyway, just like I said, people helped me. So Yeah, that's incredible. Um, we've had John. John's a great guy, and what he does for the industry is incredible. So, um, yeah, a big shout-out to John as well. George, has there ever been a um, a pivotal trade experience that has offered some significant learning for you? So something, you know, on the global um, spectrum, something has really stood out with you when you've sold material. You know, I, I think the biggest example that I could give would be when we were loading containers, we were shipping uh, number one, HMS. And I was struggling to, you know, compete or to buy against my competition. And then I went over to Taiwan and I realized that they weren't really loading HMS. What they were really loading was tin or, or buying was tin. And so it was a huge change in our, in our business because I couldn't compete. I'm loading regular HMS because I'm shipping bulk cargoes. But, you know, containers are a big part of the business. And I go over there and I'm watching these containers dump and they're just dumping tin. 
you know, clean tin basically is what it was. And so, um, I mean, literally right there at that point, I called my people and um, said, look, at, stop what we're doing and stop trying to load HMS. And, it, you know, as long as a manual stick to it, it doesn't have any trash in it, you can put it in the container because, you know, Taiwan actually wanted lighter scrap for the way their furnaces were. So anyway, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but I mean, look at it. It's very much what, you know, what, uh, what we do. So, but George, that's exactly it, right? I mean, one of the key things there was the only way you found out about that was actually getting on a plane and, and going to the end users um, and, and getting involved on the other side to try and find out what is happening and why you're not necessarily able to compete. So it's something we do speak quite a bit about, which is, um, you know, get involved, go and visit the other side, especially when you're having a difficulty competing. It's often not rocket science. Um, it's just some edge that they have over you, which when, as soon as you do some homework and find out, you find that you can actually compete with it quite comfortably. But it's actually getting out there and, and doing the work to find out, not just sitting it's 100%. in the office you gotta go look. You know, and you, you think people, I, I can't tell you how many times in my life I've taught people, there's no way they're making money. There's no way they can do that. And then you, you come to find out they have an edge. You know, they're, they're doing it differently or they have a different way of doing it. And anyway, so. Yeah, and, and we don't know everything, right? Um, I think we often think we do. Um, and, and sometimes, as you say, you just jump on a plane, you find out, oh, how did I not see that? And um, yeah, you can change the way you operate quickly and um, all of a sudden, you know, you're competing again. Yep, 100%. That is exactly mm. right. George, when it comes to, um, you have multiple amount of yards, right? Um, we were saying, I think, what did we say? It's about 140. Yeah. Was it more than that? I think, I think I have 143 or 100. Right. So I would think that somebody like you, you probably monitor them quite closely, even if it's your sons that you've handed to the monitoring of the weeds, as you say. What are the key metrics that you're looking at in these businesses? And, and is it daily, weekly, monthly, you know, from inventory purchases, sales, et cetera? And how do you monitor them? So <laughs> look, you got to have a really, really good uh, software system. So we use SAI, the, you know, to be able to do it and, and obviously tracking your inventory, you know, you live or die based off your inventory, what you're purchasing and, and selling. So we run an individual uh, profit and loss on every single operation that we run. You know, I don't run them as cost centers. I run them as, as profit centers. And so we run it on every single one and, you know, tracking your inventory is crucial because I think that's the, the easiest way to get stolen from or, you know, for people to have fraud. And so we try to keep our inventories as low as possible. I don't ever try to play the market. And so I try to, we do the best job we can estimating what we're going to buy each month. And then I sell a hundred percent of whatever I think I'm going to buy. You know, we don't ever try to play the market because I don't think I'm smart enough to play the market. And so, um, you know, we just, Whatever our sale price is going to be, we try to buy against that. And, you know, I believe you make your money on the buy, you don't make it on the sale. And so uh, we focus really hard on trying to keep our inventory as low as possible. We track inventory religiously. I mean, literally every single day. And, you know, I get a, a list of all the yards and they're just color coded with red to green, you know, on uh, where they are in inventories. And we kind of have a metric where we say, if you buy a thousand tons of HMS a month in a yard, then we say you can have a hundred tons of inventory at the end of the month. And if you buy, you know, 250,000 pounds of non-ferrous at a yard, then you can have 125,000 pounds of non-ferrous. In other words, 50% of non-ferrous, 10% of ferrous. And that's kind of the metric. And anybody that is over that metric is just it's color coded. So if you're way over the metric, it'll be bright red. And if it's, you know, only a little over, you you know, might be pink or white, and then it goes to green and then shades of green, you know, as it's going down on, on where it needs to be. And so it mm -hmm. just makes it quicker. We, we, you know, when you've got 140 yards, you can't be looking at all 140 yards and the ones that are good, there's no reason to look at. And so you kind of hit the ones that are top, you watch what's going on in the inventory. It's much harder to get in trouble if you, if you have no scrap in your yard. And so, and we project out if you take if you take the average of your three months 
expenses. And if you take the difference between what you buy and sell every single day, then by the 15th of the month, you can project pretty good what's going on for the month. So in other words, just the difference between what you bought and sold, um, you can project out to the end of the month. And then if you take the average of your expenses by, you know, halfway through the month or certainly by the 20th of the month, you've got a pretty good idea whether a yard's going to make money or not. And any yard that is not projecting to make money, then you're working on it before the end of the month and not, you know, 10, 15 days after the month, because at that point in time, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, what you've just said there is absolute gold. There's a few things that I just want to touch on. One was, I guess, calculating what your profit or losses look like in, in the month, not afterwards. I mean, that is hugely important. It's something I was taught for a very long time that after the fact means absolutely nothing. You're just counting then, right? You're just counting the money, the losses or the, or the profits, but you can actually have an impact. If you get to the 20th of the month and you know which yards of yours are going to do poorly, you can focus your time, your energy, your team's time and energy to go and make sure that they can actually um, fix it before it's too late. And whether that means clearing stock, reducing expenses, buying more or buying at better prices, whatever it could be, um, that's absolutely vital you do it within the month. But then the other thing you touched on is something that we've had a lot of conversations around on Born Scrappy, which is, do you buy against the sale or vice versa? Now, I come from a, a large scrap company in, in um, Southern Africa, where we always bought against the sale, which is exactly what you've just said. I've had a lot of people tell me that um, they might sell in the middle of the month and average it out. Um, they can't really sell up front because they don't know what they're going to buy, um, et cetera, et cetera. But George, you're saying 100% the best way to stay alive in business is to um, buy against the sale. Well, Amelia, if some people are really smart and you know they're really good at trading and they can take positions uh, and you know they'll play the market. And I, I'm not a trader. So I'm much more an operations guy, and let alone the fact that you figure we're buying, you know, 70 million pounds of non-ferrous a month, and we're buying half a million tons, right? Between 400 and 500,000 tons of ferrous scrap every month. And so if you don't sell it, then the next month, you know, if you didn't sell one month, right? Well, the next month you get 800,000 tons to sell. But if even only sold 50,000 tons, well, then the next month you get six or 700,000 tons to sell. And you never get, you never get caught up. And so we do the best job we can at estimating of what we're going to buy. And then we try to sell it. It's obviously, it's never perfect, but you know, you, you, you can get pretty close and, and we try to shift all that scrap. And so now obviously when you're talking about an export yard, uh, you know, like at my docks, then if you've got ships coming in and you're loading a 40, 50,000 ton ship, you might have. You can't plan it that way because ships come in when they want to come in. But your yards that are truck or rail shipments, you know, you can get them down to the ground pretty, pretty often. And that's what we try to do. We try to shred to the ground every month. We try to ship to the ground every month. And, uh, and I try to sell everything that I buy. And, and I believe that you make your money on the buy. And so uh, you know what you're selling for and you project your price. Now, you know, like container sales, <clears throat> container sales, we sell every week. Um, that's just kind of the way the container market works. I'm talking about Ferris container sales. And so our markets where I'm big container sales and we're selling every week, then, you know, we're estimating what we're going to buy that week and we're adjusting the price. Whereas in domestic sales, you make your sale at the beginning of the month and then we work hard against it, you know, all month. Mm. Yeah. And just one thing out of interest for me, George, is when you have all these yards, how do you do inventory and stock take? You know, you mentioned fraud earlier. Um, when you dispersed across such a big region, how do you guys um, physically do that? So obviously we're tracking what we're buying and selling, right? So we have a virtual running inventory. And then you do production runs, you know, for the shredders and wire choppers and things like that, where you have to transfer the stuff. So you do production runs. And then you do a physical inventory at the end of the month. So our smaller yards will do physical inventory every single month. And our larger yards will do a physical inventory every quarter. 
and uh, and right. we'll literally weigh every single thing in the yard. And is it the managers doing their own stock tech? And the reason why I asked that is um, no, no, no. In no, Southern no, Africa, no, no. I swapped you, my you, managers around. Yeah, hundred percent. Exactly what you have to do. I mean, your manager obviously is doing the inventory, but you have to bring in a guy from another yard or two people from other yards to yeah. you know to work with them to do it. Yeah, I don't think everybody necessarily knows um, what the reason is for that. So I'll just touch on that briefly. But um, you know, if a manager, if there's any sort of issue with the manager and there could be some fraudulent tickets or whatever there is that's been happening, if he's marking his own homework, um, it's easy for him to just estimate a bit higher the stock on the floor than there actually is. Um, I used to usually have three people doing a stock take and then using the average of that. So if there is one manager there, it's quite difficult for them to um, obviously change that stock um, from what it is actually sitting on the floor. Yeah, we so. do exactly the same thing. As much as possible, I try to ship it to the ground. Obviously, the export yards, you can't. But we work really hard at keeping low inventories, uh, you know, because all of my companies, uh, the managers are on a bonus program. And so and they get zero credit for inventory. And so it puts tremendous incentive for us to ship to the ground. So. Mm, absolutely. That's very clever. Talking about, um, you know, some of your key people, how do you handle key man risk? I mean, in a company like yours, you must have people trying to hire your managers um, every day. So what sort of processes do you have them on or systems do you have your team on and how do you look after your best guys? So we, we do our bonus every single month. You know, I believe that companies that do it once a year, I just don't think it's effective. So, uh, you know, we calculate our profits every single month and we pay a bonus based on profit. And so people have all types of complicated, you know, returns, rocky return on assets. I don't know. I've never been smart enough to figure all that stuff out, you know, figuring out a return on invested capital and all this crap. And I figure if I'm not smart enough to figure it out, then my people aren't going to be smart enough to figure it out. And so, you know, I just try to keep it really simple. We give a percentage of the profits. I do an individual financial statement in every single yard. And you know, I pay a percentage of profits off that financial statement and I pay it every single month by the third pay period. And so, so that way everybody can, you know, look at it and, you know, if they had a great month then they see their money right away. Do they, does everybody get a bonus based on their individual role or is it a communal pot? So the manager, the manager gets a bonus and then um, the, you know, based on a percentage of the profits. And then the employees in the yard split the bonus. And it's, so it's just, it's based on shares. And so, which are really more arbitrary, but, you know, let's just say that the bonus to be split between the guys is $5,000. And so the, you take, and let's say that the tractor operator might get 10 shares, the uh, foreman gets 20 shares, the scale person is 15 or eight, you know, the sweeper might get five. And let's just say you add all those up, right? And it's a hundred shares. Um, and so it just means every 10 shares, right? It's worth $500. And so depending on how many shares you have, that's your bonus and I pay it every month. And do you find because you run yard by yard, they all get their own. Money. Is there any competition within SA Recycling that people are poaching each other's customers? Yeah, it's a huge problem. I mean, that's why you got to have a regional <laughs> manager. So you have a manager oversees the yard, and then you have a regional manager, which is really the principal, right? To make sure that because, and the regional manager is also making a percentage of the profits of all the yards. So he or she has tremendous incentive to not. To make sure that doesn't happen. But look, it, it, it is not a perfect system because when people are incentivized, you get some people are more aggressive than the others and they poach. It's a pain in the ass. So, But look, at, no system is perfect. Just like our country here, the United States, as great as it is, it's not perfect. And um, But I still feel we've looked at a lot of different things. I still feel the incentive program is the best way to go because I need people to hunt. You know, I mean, that's the bottom line. I don't want farmers. I need hunters. I need people to get out there and hunt. Yeah, yeah I think I only said it because I considered so many of these different business structures and bonus structures, and everything has its flaws. So you're quite right. There's no perfect system out there. Absolutely not. 
Um, I've spoken to many people that don't have a perfect system. Everyone is flawed in some way, but I guess it's just choosing your own poison, right? And knowing how yep. to manage that and knowing what to look out for. Yep, and it makes exactly. sense by having a regional manager because that regional manager doesn't want people competing in their region because that's affecting their overall margin. So they didn't exactly. have to manage that and that's their issue. Yeah, exactly. that's great. George, in the growth of your company, there, you know, you spoke about bank kind of pulling their um, facility at a stage. How have you handled um, your capital growth? So how have you handled, what sort of strategy have you had? Um, do you recommend people um, sell equity in their business and bring in, take loans out? You know, what sort of things have you done in the past? Because in order to grow, we need to have funds. We need to have some form of capital, whether it's buying equipment, buying more stock and waiting to get paid uh, at a later stage to get a premium and to compete, you know, all of these sort of things. What have you used and what do you recommend? Well, so I mean, look at it. If you taking in an equity investor, it's obviously really expensive capital. And you hear all the horror stories of what happened to different people that, uh, you know, go broke doing that. I mean, the minute you sell a piece of your business, right, then the question is, you know, who's got control? Do they have control? Do you have control? And every time you lose control, that's when people get into trouble. So I think your cleanest way is just to borrow money um, and not, you know, try to sell equity in your business. I just feel like that's the safest. And obviously, but you really got to watch your loan covenants and make sure that you're you know, living within your means on it and people get into trouble. But uh but I, I feel like, you know, the, especially the bigger companies that, you know, took equity investors in there and tried to go public and stuff, you know, a lot of those people have lost control. So. Mm. Yeah, especially when you're going public. Absolutely. I think um, when you borrow money um, and you take a loan from the bank, as long as what you're using it for is going to have a decent return, you should be okay, right? So if you're buying it for a shredder and you already have the volume coming in and you're selling it to you know, then it can make sense, but it's that 100%. risk when you, it's that risk of going with a bank who can pull its facility for whatever reason, which, which, you know, similar to what we were speaking about earlier about bonuses. Um, uh, there's no perfect science. It's what's going to work best for you. Yep. hundred percent. Um, talking about using capital, what is the best or worst equipment purchase you've ever made and why now I, this isn't the name and shame. So I don't necessarily want you to say the worst was this and this was the brand. It's more about, you know, the story that, that had an impact on you. It could be the best or worst. Well, I mean, look at us going to putting a mega shredder in, in California. You know, we put the first mega shredder in California. We bought it from Scott Newell, you know, from uh, the shredder company. And, you know, certainly that's hands down the best investment we ever did. You know, the first one we did, you know, at that time we had an old, we had an old hammer mill, which I actually also bought from Scott when he'd sold a new one. We had an old hammer mill and uh, we, we couldn't do the tons to it. You know, it was only a 74 inch mill and we put in a 6,000 horsepower, you know, 124 inch mill or 126 inch mill. You know, I can't remember now, you know, which allowed us, you know, to do volumes. And, you know, we thought at the time it would take us three years and we could get to 30,000 tons. And uh, the market started running. This was 2004. The market started running and we hit 50,000 tons like in three months, and, you know, hands down. Wow. But that's just pure dumb luck, you know, that we hit the market at the right way. But obviously we took the risk to put the shredder in, but that's the best acquisition or the best, you know, purchase we ever did. We were making as much money in one month as we'd made in the prior, you know, 10 years. So it was, wow. it was an incredible time. So. And we use that money to expand. I mean, that's why we grew so fast back then. So we use that money to expand, buy more yards, put another mega shredder in Bakersfield and to really grow the companies. Um, so, I mean, that change of trajectory completely, that must have had a huge, huge impact. It's quite interesting, right? You say, you say it was dumb luck, but you've got to be in it to win it. And if you hadn't taken that chance and you hadn't bought that shredder, um, you wouldn't be necessarily where you are now. Yeah, I, I, okay, I believe you make your own luck. You know, I, I truly believe that. And I say that in my book, but, um, you know, I believe you have to put yourself out there. I mean, first, you have to decide to take the risk. And so, 
you know, so we decided to take like just on that shredder, we, we thought it was going to take us three years, you know, to be able to build the volume up and the market start run. Now, we could have never planned the market was going to run, but obviously we had to take the risk. And so, so but certainly it was luck on our part that, you know, concurrence of events to make that that uh, to make the world just go crazy. I mean, and they went crazy. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. I, I'd never done so much business in my life as I was doing right then. I think um, almost every episode in season one had a trader who's been doing this for 30 or 40 years talk about the build up to 2008 and how you yeah. literally couldn't lose money. Yeah, exactly. It was un it was just unbelievable. And that's what it was. It was just unbelievable. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so buying new equipment, what's your process to decide if you need something? And then after that, what are you going to buy? Well, look, if we're, if, you know, we can, if we can get a return, really, we'd like to see a return in a year, but if we can get a return in two years, you know, we're going to go out and buy it when you're talking about a big piece of equipment. Um, as far as our process to go, I mean, at this point in time, you know, we know what we like. And, uh, and so when we're buying equipment, look, at I like cat equipment. <clears throat> You know, I, I think Scott makes a great shredder. If I'm going to buy a shredder. I mean, if I was going to build them from scratch, I'm going to get it from Scott. If I'm going to run a skid steer, I'm going to do a cat skid steer. I mean, there's just, you know, different stuff that, you know, we believe is the best equipment out there. So, Okay, so you've already pretty much made your mind up on what the right equipment is. That comes yeah. with experience. So yeah. if, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I want to run a different piece of equipment, um, and they'd have to pitch that to you, are you are you listening to it or, or you've made up your mind? No, no. Look, at it. we'll we'll always listen. And as I said a second ago, I really like Cat, right? But when I was in Italy, you know, the same company that makes John's um, uh, shears, the Sierra shears, you know, they make a small crane that you can drive around without putting the outriggers down. And uh, I really want to try one of those. You know, so look at it. if I see something that's different, you know, I'll try it. Johnny's going to bring one over for me, and I'm going to try it. But, uh, uh, or maybe he's already got it here. Anyway, I'm supposed to get one to try. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, certainly you see different stuff that makes sense and that you try it. But, um, and, you know, because I buy so many yards, lots of times they come with other equipment. And so, mm. uh, you know, so, I mean, I end up with a lot of Cenobogans. I end up with a lot of the beers. And, and it's not that they're not good equipment. It's just I have more cats, and so it's easier for me to stock parts. Got gotcha. you. So. Yeah, it makes sense actually. When you're acquiring all these businesses, you've tried most of the pieces of equipment because yeah, of all the I, I get them. I get them in all the time. You know, I have every imaginable type of crane, I'm sure. piece of equipment, wire chopper, you name it. I got them. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And with when it comes to culture, I see a lot on you know social media posting by SA Recycling, and um, your team seems to really. Um, you know, bleed for you guys. What is it that you think sets SA Recycling apart um, that has such a cohesive team and culture? Well, look at we empower our people. I, I tell people all the time, look at you know if you if you disagree with me, just tell me, right? It's okay to tell me no, and you know, and I try to read the body language on it. You know, if, if Especially if it's a new person, you know, they're thinking, okay, there's no way I'm telling this guy no. You know, he's the owner of the company. I'm not going to tell him no. But if you see that body language, then I try to drag it out of him. And, you know, because it, the last thing I need is for someone to yes me, right? The last thing I need is for someone, you know, they know what I'm proposing isn't going to make sense. And, you know, for us to head off the wrong direction. But, you know, the people that work me for a really long time, they have no problem telling me no. OK, as a matter of fact, they don't even think twice about it. You know, everybody speaks up. This is not a dictatorship. You know, I I believe that, uh, you know, the success of my company is 100 percent because of the people. It's not because of me. People ask me all the time, well, why don't you know come up partners with me here? Why don't you do this? You know, why don't you do this deal on your own? And it's like, OK, the thing that makes SA recycling so great is because of the people. It is not because of me. And so, you know, you, uh, you look at yourself, I, I'm just the conductor, but the people playing the instruments, I mean, they're the ones that are making the music, right? It is not me. I feel like the thing that makes our company 
so strong is because everybody feels very confident in speaking up and just saying, no, that's bullshit. That's not going to work. Okay. I don't like it. No, I don't think we should do it. And, you know, feels really confident in, in speaking up. Yeah. I think it's, I think that's vital, George. I think that's brilliant. Um, And it comes across anybody I speak to from within the company absolutely loves it. So it makes sense to hear that from the top. And, you know, when you're acquiring businesses, which you've done a lot of, in fact, probably more than anybody else in our industry, what do you look for straight away? And I realize they're all different, but what are the kind of things that um, makes you think, you know, if somebody says, oh, there's a business for sale and it has this, this, and this. And if you hear that immediately, you think I'm interested. You know, what are those points that you look for? Well, look, if you ask my family, they'll say I've never met a scrapyard I didn't like. <laughs> but um, I mean, it's a standard <laughs> joke. But really, look at strategically, you know, we try to look at what is going to affect us. You know, if I already own a shredder or two in an area, if I can take out another shredder that's maybe competing against me or costing me money, you know, a competitor that's costing me money because in my opinion, they're overpaying. Look at every, every scrap dealer always thinks the other guy's overpaying, right? I mean, it's just what it is. But, you know, if I think someone <clears throat> is overpaying in a market and they're costing me money, and if I can buy that company and, uh, uh, and bring market share more in line, well, then obviously, you know, would, that, that strategically would be good. Or if it's a new region, you know, when we had the opportunity to buy newer recycling in Georgia, you know, that fit our model perfectly. They had shredders, they had feeder yards. You know, we liked that hub and spoke concept. And so, um, you know, it was a great, you know, it was, it was an old time family business. They had great people, uh, you know, great employees. You know, it was an ideal company for us to buy. <clears throat> and so I, I try to look at fill-ins, you know, if we can own more scrap in a region, then I think that makes sense. Or if we're going into a new region, if it's got multiple yards, you know, that you can uh, hub and a spoke. When we bought, uh, we bought Tennessee Valley Recycling from Joel Dembo, you know, they had the shredder and they had multiple feeder yards. And it was, that's our kind of business that we like to buy. Hmm. You know, you've got a, you've got a shredder, you've got yards feeding it. And that's, that fits our model really well. And is there any um, other expansion outside of the U.S. plant? No, I, I, Look at uh, people ask me all the time, you know, do I want to do I want to go outside of the country? I, I feel like there's plenty of scrapyards that buy in the U.S. I don't think I need to go anywhere else. It doesn't mean I wouldn't if there was some incredible opportunity that, you know, fit our model, the hub and a spoke that you just couldn't pass up. But um, I, it's not my plan. I don't know the laws in the other countries. I think the U.S., in spite of all its trials and tribulations, is still the greatest country in the world. And, um, and I feel like there's unlimited opportunity for us to grow in this market. And for me to go someplace else, I feel like just it takes away my ability to grow in this market. So. Okay. Got you. Um, George in season two, we're going to, um, we'll follow our normal ending, but before we do, I just wanted to ask you, um, is there anybody that you would like you you think we should interview on Born Scrappy? So who would you like to see up next? Oh boy, I don't know. I mean, have, did you already interview John Sacco? I just feel like yeah, that guy yeah, knows yeah. everybody. You already he, interviewed yeah, John. Yeah, John, we've had John on. Absolutely, he's okay. fantastic. Yes, you already interviewed John. Um, how about Jay Rabinowitz from Alter? Deal. He'll be he'll be next on the list. Yeah, he, look at Jay's a great guy, and and you know he. You know, he grew up in the business uh, just like I did. And so, and, you know, he's, he was with Snitzer and now he's with Alter. And Alter's an amazing company. And uh, it's, uh, I think Jay would be great. Mm. We've had Michael. I'm good friends with Michael um, Goldstein. Sure. So um, I'll, I'll chat to Michael and uh, get him to set up Jay and I'll get, a, get his contact and I'll, I'll reach out to Jay and have him on for sure. I, I mean, the stories fantastic. Jay tells about his family business growing up, they're just hysterical. So, Right. That's yeah. awesome. Um, George, before we end, we just like to get to know our guests a little bit better. So it's a quick fire last few questions. Have you got a, a favorite TV series or movie? I don't watch TV. 
I mean, not even five minutes a month. And so, um, I mean, we do go to the movies once in a while. I certainly like, you know, the James Bond movies, Mission Impossible, you know, like those kind of movies. I don't like horror movies. I don't ever watch that kind of genre. I hate that crap. Yeah, uh, but, I'm the uh, same here. You know, <clears throat> I certainly like action movies. I, I don't go to a lot of movies. I maybe see a couple a year, but and I don't okay, ever so watch TV. We'll put you down as a James Bond fan. No problem. It, it suits you really well. And um, favorite place to visit? You must have been to heaps of places around the world. What's your favorite place to visit? You know, I love Tahiti. Um, we certainly love Italy a lot. Uh, I think they would be, you know, our top two. I say we. I'm talking about me and my wife and, and my family, but. Uh, you know, we, we spent my 40th birthday, 50th birthday, 60th birthday um, in Tahiti. And, uh, and we brought all, the whole family there. And so I assume when I turn 70 here in a couple of years, which I find it hard to believe that's possible. But uh, when I turn 70 here in a couple of years, I assume we'll probably go back, you know, to Tahiti again. <clears throat> but but we love Italy. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time in Italy, too. And so, okay. And... I know you don't watch a lot of TV. Do you read any? Do you read a lot of books? So when I was younger, I mean, I read, I just read voraciously. But now, pretty much, you know, between emails and trying to keep up with the news or whatever, I I feel like I can never get, I can never cut up. As it is, my assistant reads all my emails and tries to delete everything. You know, they all show <laughs> up on her phone and on her computer, and so it t- it's a couple people trying to keep up with my emails uh, as it is. And anyway, so. I don't really read too much anymore, uh, but okay. uh, I, I'm hoping one of these days it'll happen again. So. Yeah. And um, to end off with, have you got a favorite quote you sometimes use? So this is I, maybe it's not exactly a quote, but we we joke, you know, in uh, as we were building the business that my brother used to have on his wall. He used to say, "We the unwilling, him and and my brothers." Led by the unqualified me, now <laughs> attempt to do the impossible with nothing, right? <laughs> because, you know, we would build all this equipment out of nothing. You know, we built it out of scrap and you never had any budget. But, uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I love it. Anyway, That's brilliant. I- my favorite, my favorite uh, quote to my wife is the only lie I ever told you was that I liked you when I already knew I loved you. And so oh. I tell uh, I tell my wife that one all the time. Yeah, I saw that on a wall. I saw that on a wall in Cleveland. And um, anyway, it's at it's a restaurant called Johnny's, and it's on the wall. And it's the only lie I ever told you was that I liked you, and I already knew I loved you. I love I love that quote. That is and, brilliant. Um, I don't think the, people uh, came to Born Scrappy thinking that those were the quotes they were going to get. And, and I don't think they thought that was going to come from George Adams, but we'll take that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. There's one that I'm looking for the one in my book, um, which I really like. It's which is to accomplish great things. We must not only act, but also dream, not only plan, but also believe. And so anyway, I love that quote. And I start out my book with it. And, um, and the guy who wrote that quote, it's, I credit my book. I can never remember the guy's name, but, and I've always loved this quote because, um, so many people dream and don't act. And so many people act, but don't ever dream of the things they can do. So it's always been one of my favorite <clears throat> quotes, but, uh, you got to plan and you got to believe, you know, you got to believe in yourself. You got to believe that you can do it. You know, so many people, I feel like they don't know how to get there. And so they just don't take the first step. And I try to tell them all the time, it doesn't matter. You don't have to figure it all out ahead of time. You don't have to know how you're going to get there. Just start down the path and figure it out. And, you know, you look at, <clears throat> I always use the, the point out, like you look at the people that settled this country, the U.S., that started from the east to work their way west. They had no idea what they were going to get. And what they were going to hit and how they were going to cross the rivers and how they're going to cross the mountains. They just figured it out. And, you know, so often I just feel like, you know, you start down a path and you figure it out and you don't have to. So so many people don't start because they can't figure out how to get to here. And so they don't start. And, uh, you know, for me, I have a direction where I want to go. And I just head that direction. I figure I'll figure it out. 
Mm. So um, I think it's Reed Hoffman, um, the founder of LinkedIn, says um, you should jump off the cliff and build an aeroplane on the way down. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a little extreme, but look at you know, it's uh, <laughs> look at that. But I'm it's funny, writing. right? Because it's that first step that everybody's so scared of because they don't know what's going to happen next. But it's funny when you do jump off the cliff, you're very much incentivized to build that airplane very quickly um, instead of having that fear of not going at all. Yeah. Yeah. Look at you just start, start down the road. And that's just what I do. You yeah. Know, I believe you got to dream where you want to go and then you got to act on it and plan it and head that way. So. Yeah, it's a brilliant quote. And it's a great way to finish up. So George, um, I really appreciate on a Sunday, you finding the time to come and hang out with me um, and to give our listeners um, so much brilliant gold and gems that you've given us today. So thank you so much and have a great day. All right, you got it.